Hi everyone, my name is Paul Brogesen. Welcome to this workshop about Python states. Um, today I'm going to be showing you what Python states are and this workshop is going to function as sort of a, uh, a primer on getting started with it. This workshop is based on my course, which you can find online that teaches you everything there is to know about Python states and then some, uh, which we will learn about in the video I'm going to be showing you now. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me with the contact details you can see here on the slide, uh, either on my Twitter or on my email, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. My name is Paul Voisesen, and I'm a technical artist focused on making people's life easier using powerful procedural tools and workflows. If you are a Houdini TD building tools for yourself or for artists, you will know how important it is for a tool to be easy to use. With Python states, you're able to build any type of interaction model in the viewport for your tool using nothing but simple Python code. In this course, we will start with understanding Python states and then quickly progress to building our very first Python state. Get access to both theory and snippets of code on slide format, as well as several hours of video content showing every aspect of Python states there is to know. Along the way, you will learn how to implement things such as UI event handlers to handle mouse, keyboard and pen inputs. Once we get the hang of that, we will continue with selections, guide geometry, drawables, handles, context menu and state parameters. Throughout the course, you will be presented with challenges to check your knowledge of what you've just learned and get some actual hands-on practical experience. If you're serious about leveling up your tools in Houdini, I hope to see you at the course. All right, so that was just a quick promo video for my course. Uh, definitely check it out after this, uh, this session. So who am I? My name is Paul Anderson. Like I said at the beginning, I'm a game developer. Uh, I primarily focus on uh, you know, Houdini and real time in Unreal, in Unity, in other game engines. And I like helping uh, solve problems that people have, right? So I was previously working at SideFX where I was the lead for SideFX Labs. Uh, you've probably seen you know, many of the tools that I built there. Um, ever since then, I, I left SideFX, I started my own business, and since then I'm basically doing freelance with uh, lots of awesome clients. So if you ever need someone to help consult you with any work, or if you ever need someone to help you out with some actual work, uh, please feel free to reach out to me on my website. All right, so what are we gonna be building today? Um, so what I wanted to build today is a fairly simple tool that is going to teach you the basics of Python states. And that's basically this, uh, this block placer node here, uh, which allows us to place objects with the mouse on top of each other. Uh, we'll have a context menu like you saw here uh, somewhere in the video, which is basically this uh, right-click menu allowing us to change the block. And then we also have some modifiers uh, using, for example, shift or control that allows us to uh, rotate the blocks using uh, the mouse wheel. Okay, so the files that we'll need. Um, for the people that are looking at this uh, this video on the course materials itself, uh, you can find those in these locations. You you know where they are, you've seen them before. Uh, for anyone else, um, there's probably gonna be a link in the description of this video with uh, these files here. Um, where you can just download them. Make sure that you install the uh, the OTL or the HDA in the correct location and then simply load up this HIP file. Okay, so what are we gonna be doing? I've broken it down into five very simple steps. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze the HDA that I've built already. Uh, then we're gonna create the actual state for it, right? The Python state. Then we're gonna learn about getting and setting parameters of a node using Python and Houdini. Then we're going to make the mouse do things for us, right? We want to be doing things interactively in the viewport using the mouse uh, buttons, using the mouse wheel, using the keyboard. Uh, so we're going to be doing that uh, in Python states. And last but not least, we're going to uh, implement a very simple context menu allowing us to switch the block that we're using to place. Okay, so before we begin, uh, you might be thinking, uh, Python states, what the hell is that? Well, Python states are, uh, in essence, just a layer of interactivity that has been um, put on top of HDAs, right? You've previously seen in Houdini, you know, things like handles, um, for example, on the bend modifier, on the extrusion SOP, right? Where you have, you know, this guide geometry and this handle that you can pull. You've probably seen the box 
um, gizmo, right? That allows you to scale the box interactively in the viewport, as well as, of course, a transform handle. Well, these are all interactive elements that you can use in the viewport to do things with instead of having to go to the parameter interface and change the parameters. So this allows you to work a lot more interactive in the viewport. Python states allow you to basically write these types of interactions yourself. And in what language do you write them or how do you write them? Well, of course, in Python. That's why it's called Python states. Okay, so what we're going to be doing first is we're going to analyze the HDA that I've built on the inside. And it essentially looks like this. Uh, we have this block HDA that generates some geometry, which we'll see in a second. We have a point generate that generates the points that will copy our geometry to using copy to points. And then we have this grid here that we merge with the block so that we have some object to place it on, which then goes to this null node here, which is called block collision. We're going to be using this to do ray casts with in the tool itself. And of course, we have an output SOP that uh, displays the result of our HGA. Then for the parameters, it's also fairly straightforward. We have a multi-parm, which allows us to uh, create multiple copies of a set of parameters. And each one of these multi-parm entry, as you can see, is going to describe the properties of a single block. So for example, what's the position of the block? What is the rotation of the block? What is the hue of the block? And which version of the block do we want to place? For example, the eight pin or the four pin. All right, so we've reached our very first action item. We're gonna be looking at the HDA and the multi-parm inside of Houdini. So here we go. This is the scene that I've recorded that video with. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the uh, parameters. So I'm going to clear this real quick, and then I'm going to add an entry here on the, uh, the multi-parm. So this is what we're used to in Houdini, right? We can uh, use a multi-parm to, for example, uh, change some parameters, right? We can you know, use this to rotate the block. Uh, we can change the hue using these parameters, and we can, of course, also uh, change the variant, right? So these are the, the functionalities that we created on the HDA uh, using this multi-parm. Now, if we add another entry, you can see that now we have two blocks, right? So if you wanted to align these two blocks, we'd have to very carefully, you know, match the rotations. We'd have to uh, match the locations like that, and then, you know, move it up just like that. But as you can see, you know, this is quite tedious. Um, it's not fun to do that. It is possible, uh, but we want to write some system that allows us to do that interactively. All right, so those are the parameters. Let's take a look at the inside of the tool. I'm pressing Control B to sort of zoom in and make the network editor full screen, which also when we press P shows us our parameters here on the top right. All right, so I've created the point generate and this point generate has a channel reference to that multi-parm, which means that for every multi-parm entry, we're gonna get a point. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm gonna be copying all of the geometry, right? Onto the points that we've generated using the point generate. Now, what does this tool output? As you can see, it simply outputs uh, some geometry here um, and it has merged all of those together on the same location. If we use the align and distribute, uh, you can see that this actually consists out of multiple pieces of geometry um, defined or uh, distinguished using a variant attribute, a primitive attribute. And the reason I've done that is because that allows me to use the variant functionality right, the piece attribute on the copy to points. And so this wrangle here, what this does is it reads, depending on the point number, the multi-parm entry that we're interested in. So point number zero is going to read all the parameters, right, from multi-parm entry number one. It is going to set these attributes, like the rotation, the position, the color, the variant, which the copy to points will use to copy the correct piece of geometry onto, as well as set the color, set the rotation, and set the position with. We then merge that using a grid and a merge stop, giving us a nice little ground at the bottom. We then blast the knobs like that as a primitive group, because uh, as you'll see later on, we're gonna do some recasting and I did not want to use the knobs to collide with. Then of course the output SOP is simply going to output the actual rendering result. So not the blasted result, but the full thing. Okay, so now that we've seen that, we can move on to the next section, which is creating the actual state. So this is, of course, very exciting. And um, the easiest way to create a state in Houdini is make use of the viewer state code generator, uh, which you can find either inside of the asset itself 
or as an actual dedicated panel you can find in you know the panels themselves. Okay, here's a little tip for you. Um, states can also be dynamically registered and unregistered using HOM methods. Uh, so if you want to do that, right, if you really want to micromanage all your states, you could, but by default, um, you know, asset live state is controlled by the HDA itself. So when an HDA gets loaded that has a Python state, the embedded state inside of the tool gets loaded. And of course, unloading the HDA will also unregister the embedded uh, state. So we're going to move on to our next action item, which is creating a state. So we're going to use the generator to add some events. So the on enter, on mouse event, on mouse wheel event, and on menu action. So let's go back to Houdini. And then what I'm going to be doing first is I'm going to make a new um, version of this HDA that I'm going to be block placer uh, new because I don't want to overwrite the one that I've created for um, the people following the course. Okay, so we have a quick little error. That's because um, when you create a new version of the HDA, it does not change this internal uh, default state. So in your case, you're probably going to be, you know, making a new HDA, then you won't have this issue. But if you ever have a node with a state on it and you use, you know, the new uh, versioning tools to, you know, create a new version of something, make sure that in type properties on your node, you actually also change the default state like that. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, some issues uh, about it's complaining about duplicate states. Okay, so let's see that this still works. It indeed does. Great. So to create a state, you click on type properties on the node itself, and then you go to the interactive tab. And since you know this node already has a state, you'll find some Python code here, but we're gonna be clearing that like this, you know, clear it, and then we're gonna click new because we want to create a new Python state. On here, you can set the name of the state, right? This is the, the node name by default. We can set the label. So we can, for example, call this a block placer. And this is what you'll find here in the top left, right? When you enter a state, and then all the way here at the bottom, you can enable these checkboxes for the event handlers you want the generator to generate for you. So the ones that I'm interested in is on enter, on a mouse event, on a mouse wheel event, and we also want to uh, use the on menu action because we want to uh, bind an action menu, right, or context menu. Let's see if there's anything else that we need. Um, as you can see, there are quite a lot of these. We're not going to be covering these in this workshop. These are all covered in the uh, the course that you can uh, find online. Okay, so hit accept, and this is going to generate some Python code for us. As you can see, we now have the actual body of the state. We have a state object here with these event handlers, as well as this method here at the bottom, which allows us to register the state and make Houdini aware of its existence. Okay, so hit apply and accept, and now we should have a node with a state. When we enter it, it's not going to do a single thing because we only have some boilerplate code that we've generated. Now, how are we going to modify the Python state code? Uh, what you could do is you could go into type properties and edit it in that window that you saw before. But what I like doing is using the edit extra section source code um, menu from labs, which allows us to select the viewer state module and edit it right inside of your preferred IDE. And for me, that is actually the uh, Sublime Editor. Okay, so now that we have that, let's take a brief look at all these methods here. So on enter is going to get called as soon as the uh, scene viewer enters the state of you know the viewer state, right? So for example, when you hit enter or when you right click on a node and say you know uh, enter state, this method is going to get called, and this allows us to initialize some defaults for the state itself. For example, set some default values, uh, modify some parameters, or do some other things. On mouse event, uh, processes mouse events, as this, uh, this doc string describes. This is where, for example, we can do things whenever we move our mouse, when we click with our mouse, when we, for example, hold shift and do something else with our mouse. This is where all of this um, gets done. On mouse wheel, on mouse wheel event, sort of describes itself. This handles everything to do with processing a mouse wheel event. So when you scroll something on your mouse wheel, this is going to get called. 
Then for on menu action, this is going to get called as soon as a menu action happens. So when we, for example, have that context menu and we click on uh, an option, this is going to get called for us. And then here at the bottom, we have the create viewer state template, which simply registers the state. All right, next section. Getting and setting parameters. So this, of course, as you can imagine, is going to be quite important because what we want to do is we want to add a layer of interactivity on the HD that we got from the course materials. And to do that, we're gonna do some things with our mouse, with our keyboard, with our scroll wheel, and then we need to use Python to set the parameters so that the user doesn't have to do it manually. And so how can we do that? Well, by default, you can grab inside of uh, the on enter the node reference using quarks and then get the node uh, dictionary item from the quarks dictionary. To access a parm, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, the default one or the most used way is uh, node.parm and then the parm name of that node that you are grabbing it from. And it's going to give you a parameter object that we can do various things with. For example, reading attribute val reading parameter values, setting parameters, uh, values, setting keyframes, and doing many other types of manipulations. To get uh, a parm tuple, for example, if you have a vector parameter, then you can use parm tuple. And this is super convenient because it also allows you to set uh, a parm tuple with, without having to set the individual components. Now, to evaluate a parameter and get its value, we can use these methods here, or these are some of them. If we, for example, know that a parameter is an integer and we want to evaluate it as an integer, you can use eval as int, and same goes for eval as string and eval as float, which are also self-explanatory. Now, to set a parameter value, you can simply call parm.set and then pass in the new value that you want to set. You can also actually pass in another parameter, which is going to make a parameter reference for you. If you want to set a tuple, right, on, for example, palm tuple, you also simply call set and then feed it the tuple of the correct length that fits with the parameter that you've gotten. Now, a little pro tip, if you want to set multiple parameters at once and you know all of the values and you have a dictionary of those parameters and their values, you can use node.setParms and then pass in the dictionary like so. Okay, so let's try and uh, get and set a parameter using Python. We're also going to be adding some helper functions to our Python state uh, to manage the multi-parm for us. Okay, so first things first, in the on enter, what we want to do is we want to store a reference to the node itself because we want to access that throughout the Python state. So what I like doing is just simply calling self the node equals none. And um, the reason I'm just setting it to none is because here in the on enter, we're going to be setting self that nodes equals quark node like that. And the reason I'm adding it here as no, uh, none is to simply make it uh, easy for me to see that this is a variable that exists and I'm going to use it throughout the state. Okay, so now when we hit enter and hit save, um, our viewer state inside of Houdini should have automatically updated. Now, Let's try and uh, set the multi-parm entry to one um, if it is not yet set to one, okay? So as you can see, this parameter is called blocks. So what we're gonna do here in the on enter, let's just remove this code here real quick. We're gonna say self.node.parm and then we're gonna grab the parameter called blocks, right? Just like we saw inside of Houdini. Let's go back and verify that this parameter was indeed called blocks. Like that. Now, to get its value, we're gonna evaluate it as an int. So we're gonna say eval as int, just like we've seen in that slide. And what they should give us is it should return for us an integer describing the parameter value in its current state. So we're gonna say uh, number entries equals that, okay? And then what we're gonna say is we're gonna say if number entries equals zero, then what we want to do is we simply want to set the uh, multiparm entry to one. So we're gonna say self.node.parm blocks set one. So what we're doing once again is we're grabbing the parameter object and then we're gonna setting its value to one. 
So let's hit save and enter our state here and keep an eye on what happens here with our multiparm. Now, as you can see, when we hit enter, on enter is going to get called, which then runs this code here. We're setting self.node. We are grabbing the number of entries of the multiparm. And if that is indeed zero, we're going to set its value to one. Now let's exit the state by hitting escape and then trying that again. Now, as you can see, nothing is happening because our parameter is set to one. Okay, all good. The other thing that we wanted to do, right, the action item, is create some helper functions that allow us to um, do this, what we're doing here, a lot easier. So we're gonna say def um, get multi farm entries self. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cut this line of code here like that. And we're gonna simply return that. So we're gonna say self, uh, return self.node parm .evals int. And so whenever we call this method here, we should now be getting the number of multiparm entries, okay? So instead of having to repeat this code all over, we're simply gonna be able to run this method. Uh, and in case you want to you know, change any of that, then we simply have to change what's in here and not all the code to our, our state. Now, the other thing that we want to do is we want a function that can add a new multiparm entry. So we're going to say def um, add new multiparm entry, like that. And then what we want to do is, first of all, grab the number of entries that we have, like that. And then we are going to set the multiparm entries, right? Plus one. So we're gonna say self.node.parm blocks set. And then what do we wanna set it to? We wanna set it to number of entries that we already have plus one. And so now whenever we call this, it should increment our multiparm entries by one. So we're gonna do that. Instead of running this code, we're simply gonna change it to be like that. Okay, all good. Now we've done that, we have learned how to get and set parameter values in its basics. Okay, let's move on to the most exciting part of the uh, session, which is making the mouse do actual things. So let's take a look at the on mouse event, uh, event handler, the on mouse double click event. We're not gonna use that one. We are, however, going to use on mouse wheel event to um, manage mouse wheel scrolls. We are going to be creating a geometry intersector, right? Which allows us to intersect with geometry in the scene. We're gonna be casting some rays from the mouse into the scene, uh, or at least get some uh, information about the origin and the direction from wherever the camera is looking. And we're also gonna be um, setting some parameters using the scroll value. Okay, so action items. We're gonna create a geometry intersector. We're gonna move the mouse to place a block. We're going to click to place a block. We're gonna use the mouse wheel event. Uh, to rotate the block and a mouse wheel event to modify the hue. So first things first, let's create our geometry intersector. All right, so to create the geometry intersector, um, let's create another variable here. We're gonna call it self.gi, right? The geometry intersector equals, and then we can call su, right? Which is the viewer state utils, right? Abbreviated here using su. And then we can say uh, geometry intersector, and what that needs is something we can see here in the doc string. It needs a geometry object. It needs the, a scene viewer, and then it has some optional um, arguments here that we can provide, okay? So first things first, let's create a geometry object. And so since we don't have a geometry object yet to collide with whenever we initialize our uh, state object, we're simply going to pass in an empty geometry object. Now for the scene viewer, thankfully we do have that. So we can say self dot uh, scene viewer like that. And so now we have a geometry intersector. Okay, so what does a geometry intersector need? Well, of course it needs some geometry. And so now when we look at our HDA, what do we want to be colliding our rays with? Well, I would say that it's going to be this block collision, right? This collision object here, which is a simplified version of our scene. It's going to have this ground plane that we can collide with, as well as this block object here where we can place other blocks on top of. So now to grab that node, the geometry from the node, apologies, 
what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a, um, a new method that gives us our geometry. So we're going to say def um, update collision geometry like that. And on here, we're going to say uh, self.collision geometry equals. And then we want to grab a node that lives inside of our HDA. So we say self.node, right, which is our HDA. Then we're going to say dot node. And whenever we do this, we can simply pass in the path of a node that we want from the node of our HDA, right? So in our case, uh, since block placer is that self.node, we simply need to pass in the name of the child node that we want to access. So let's pass it in like that. And then what we can say is dot geometry like that. And then what you'll see if you use this geometry this is actually going to give you a live copy of that geometry. And uh, we'll see in a bit why that is a bad idea. So I'm going to just leave it like this for now so that we can return to it later. Now, of course, my linting software is going to say it's defined outside of init. So I'm just going to initialize it as well here at the top. We're going to say just like that, collision geometry equals uh, none as well. You could make this an empty geometry object. Let's do that actually. So that when we look at our code later on, we know what type of um, variable this is. Okay. Now, what else do we need to do? We, of course, still need to make sure that our um, geometry intersector is using the collision geometry as a geometry to collide with. So on here, we are going to say um, self.update collision geometry. Now, the one thing that I did not do here is, of course, update the geometry intersector. We could either do that here, right below this, or do it in this method as well. Now, since I know that this method is not going to do anything else, uh, and we're not going to do anything complicated in this session, I'm going to update the geometry intersector right here as well. So I'm going to say self.gi.geometry equals self.collision geometry. Now, I know that this is self.gi.geometry because I've used the geometry intersector before. But if you want to, you know, know more about the geometry intersector, you can always look at, you know, the doc string of this uh, class, or uh, you know, go to the actual definition itself, where you can read the full details about it. So as you can see here, it has, you know, uh, variables called intersected, position, normal, UVW, primnum, geometry, ray origin, ray direction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and so since I know that geometry is going to be the sub geometry used for intersection, I'm simply going to set that right then and there. All right, so now when we enter our state, our geometry intersector is going to have an updated copy of the geometry of the scene that we're going to collide with. Cool, we've done our very first task of the making the mouse do things. The next thing that we want to do is we want to move the mouse to place a block. All right, let's go back into Houdini and check out what it is we need to do. Now, to move a block, we simply need to modify this position uh, parameter, right? And so to do that, we're going to be making use of the uh, on mouse event, which is going to give us the um, mouse positions in the scene itself. Now, these values that you can see here, dev.mouseX and dev.mouseY, uh, cool stuff, but not really useful for us because those are screen space coordinates. What we want to have is we want to know where in the 3D world does our mouse touch any object. Now, if you go to the previous slide, we can see that I have given a hint on how to do that. We have created an origin variable and a direction variable, uh, which we're going to set to UI event dot ray, which is going to cast a ray or tell us what we would need if we wanted to cast a ray from the mouse into the scene. Okay, so let's create those variables. We're gonna say origin and direction equals UI event dot ray, like that. So now we have these variables that we can use to cast a ray with. Okay, so now how do we actually cast a ray into the scene? Well, we once again are going to make use of the geometry intersector. 
And so when we open the geometry intersector doc string or you know, the actual definition itself, we have an example of how that is done. We simply call a gi.intersect and pass in the mouse point as well as the mouse direction. And we've literally just created those using these variables. So we're gonna say self.gi, right? Remember, gi is a member of this class that we've defined. And we're gonna intersect using the origin where does the ray need to be cast from? That is the screen space coordinate. And what is the direction that we want to be pointing it toward? That is just a variable called direction. Okay. And so now what this is going to give us is an intersection point as stored as a variable in the intersector. Now to check if we've intersected anything, what we can do is we can check the intersected member variable of this class. So we can say if, self.gi.intersected um, is not equal negative one, then we're gonna simply print the value. We're gonna say, hey, hit something, just like that, okay? So let's go back to Houdini and check out whether or not that is indeed the case. Uh, let's clear this log. Now, if we move um, you know, our mouse here in the viewport, we're gonna see it's gonna do something. It's gonna print, hey, hit something. Now, uh, it looks like this is not actually correct. Um, intersected is likely a Boolean and not the primitive number. Sorry, that's just a little bit of a confusion for me because uh, usually I use the primitive number and not the intersected function or method. Um, so let's just check it out like that and try that again. So enter our state. And now when we move our mouse outside of the collision geometry, we don't get anything printed. But when we move our mouse over the geometry, you can see that it says, hey, hit something, which is what we want, right? Because we only want to be grabbing positions when we hover the geometry itself. Okay. Now, of course, knowing whether or not we intersected something is not really exciting. What we want to be no uh, using is the position of where did we intersect. And we can use the position variable for that. So instead of printing the, uh, hey, hit something, we can also just print the position of where we hit something. So let's enter a state. And then now, oops, we forgot to say self.gi. Go back there, exit a state and enter it again. And now as you can see, we properly get some values of where we are hitting something. Now, what can we do with these values? Well, as you've guessed, we are going to be setting um, the position of the latest multi-parm entry. Now, how do we know what multi-parm entry we want to be setting? Thankfully, we have created a, um, a method that does exactly that. We're gonna say, um, uh, let's call this latest entry equals self.getMultiParm entry. Now, so this is going to give us a number. And so what I want to do is I want to make use of the um, Parm tuple uh, functionality that we've learned about. So we're going to say um, position Parm equals self dot node dot Parm tuple, and now of course we need to know what the name of that parameter is, right? The internal name, and it's called position underscore, and then the entry number of our multi Parm. So we're going to say plus underscore, and then I'm going to be making use of F strings in Python 3 because they're super awesome, which allows us to pass in a variable um, directly in here and Python will format it for us. So we're going to say uh, latest entry. And so now what it's going to do is it's going to basically say pos underscore and then grab the value of this. And then uh, we of course want to be um, setting that parameter. So we're going to say position arm dot set, and then what we're gonna do is uh, grab self dot gi dot position. Now, I know that this is going to throw an error, uh, but I'm gonna show you anyways. Oops, it does not throw an error, it's actually quite nice. But we do see that we have another problem. As you can see, when we move our mouse like this, this little block keeps coming closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. Now. Some of you might already know why that is happening because I've given you a hint earlier on. If you go inside of this uh, node here, 
and we look at the collision object, you can see that the block that we're currently placing is actually moving, right? It's, it's constantly updating this geometry. And now I've told you that when we uh, update the collision geometry like this, and we create app dot geometry, is going to create a live reference to that geometry. It's constantly evaluating. Now we of course don't want that. We simply want to store a snapshot. So I'm going to be calling dot freeze on there, which is going to freeze the geometry like it was at this time. Now of course be careful if you do this. Um, if you do this on very heavy geometry, you're of course going to blow up your RAM. Um, so use this with caution. But in our case, since we're using simplified collision geometry, that is perfectly fine. Now let's check what it looks like now when we reset it and enter our parameter uh, our node again. Now, as we can see, we are just nicely moving over the grid with our block and we can do whatever it is we want to do with it. Now, if you move the scroll wheel, nothing happens. If we click, nothing happens. So it's quite a boring state uh, at this time, but we do have the basics working of it already. Okay, let's see, what else do we want to do? We of course want to click to place a block. All right, so that's the very next thing that we want to do. Now, when we've intersected something, we are updating its position. And then what I'd like to do is whenever we press a button, right, the left mouse button, I want to um, add a new multi-parm entry, which is essentially going to freeze the latest block that we've been placing and modify a new one. Okay, so to do that, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about a new thing called uh, reason. And reason allows us to know what the reason is or what the type of thing is that happened that triggered on mouse event. Now, so to grab the reason, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say reason equals UI event dot reason. Now, you might be wondering what else is in UI event. I would say simply print UI event and you're gonna know. Uh, but for now, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm simply gonna be printing reason uh, because I just wanna show you what's required for this session. Uh, so now let's check it out. When we enter it, you can see that UI event reason dot located means that we've moved our mouse. But when I click simple, you know, click and release, it's gonna say picked. When I click and hold, it's gonna say start. Then it's gonna say active when I move it while moving the mouse and then when I release, it's gonna say changed, okay? Now, so what are we interested in? We're interested in picked, right? Which means a simple uh, click. Um, so let's go here in our state, remove this print. And um, we are going to say in here, if reason equals who dot uh, UI event reason, dot picked then we're going to say print placed block uh, not blocks block right a single block right, let's clear this console and so now uh, oops it looks like i missed or misspelled something uh, that is because i typed who ui it of course needs to be who like that exit our state enter it again and so now when we click you can see it says place block all right, perfect, just what we need. Now, we don't need it to print place block. We, of course, wanted to add a new multi-parm entry. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna say uh, self.add new multi-parm entry. And the other thing that we wanna do is of course want to update the collision geometry because now we've added a new block and we wanna be able to place on top of that block. So we need to update our collision geometry. But thankfully, we've been smart. We have created the helper function for that. So we're gonna say, self.update collision geometry. All right, perfect. So now what we should have is a very simple state that is going to add a first entry when we enter our state. And when we click, it's going to add a block. And then once we've clicked, it has created a new block that we can now move. And as you can see, we can also place our block here on top of the other block because we are updating the collision geometry, just like that. How cool is that? You've created your very first Python state that allows you to place blocks in a scene. Now, what you might notice is that it doesn't always grab the picked uh, when, it's, when it's called, when you click. And that is because multi-parms in Houdini uh, are very slow. So if we hide our parameters here, you can see that it does work properly. 
Um, so just a gotcha, the code is not wrong. Uh, the implementation of uh, all these parameters here is just not great and not very optimized. Okay, so we've done clicked the block. Now what we wanna do is we wanna be learning about mouse wheel events, how to rotate a block and how to change the hue. Now, to get the scroll, we're gonna be making use of the on scroll wheel event. And in there, we wanna grab the value of scroll. So let's take a look at that code. Let's go down here and take a look at on mouse wheel event. Now, to know what our uh, scroll value is, we can simply copy this line of code here, which once again is simply grabbing the dot mouse wheel value from the UI event dot device. Same thing as, you know, the reason, uh, we're also gonna make use of the device. All right, so we're going to say scroll equals who, uh, sorry, um, we're doing this in the wrong event. We're going to say uh, scroll equals UI event dot device dot scroll. And I think it's called scroll wheel, mouse wheel, apologies, like that. And that is going to give us the scroll value. Now let's print what scroll actually entails. And you might be surprised of the value it's gonna give you. So think about it real quick. What do you think it's going to give you? Is it going to give you the position of the scroll wheel? Is it going to give you a direction or is it going to give you something else? Now, if you move the scroll wheel, we can now see that it either returns a value of a negative one or one or two, it looks like when we scroll very fast. That's interesting. I did not know that was possible. Um, but essentially, it gives you a direction of the scroll, okay? And so, you know, a value of one and a value of negative one is convenient for us because that allows us to change this parameter here, right? So let's do that. Uh, we are simply going to say um, copy the parameter values using the value of scroll, okay? So we're going to say uh, self.arm. Uh, sorry, self.node, right? We want to grab the arm of the node. And then what parameter do we want to grab? We want to be grabbing the rotation. So we're going to say rot underscore and then the multi-parm entry. So we're going to say rot underscore. And then once again, um, use an F string. Make sure you put an F in front of the string here. And then we're going to say uh, latest entry. And what is latest entry? Uh, I'm just going to copy the line of code that we have uh, used earlier on, which once again, simply is calling this method here, self.getMultiParm entries. This is going to give us the latest entry of our multiparm. Now, we of course wanna be storing the value of this parameter so that we can update it. So we're gonna say uh, current scroll, uh, actually let's be more descriptive. Let's say current rotation equals self.parm rotation underscore realist multiparm entry dot eval as int, right? We want to grab the current rotation as an integer value. Now to update the parameter value, we're going to copy this line of code, but instead of evaluating it, we of course are going to set it. And what do we want to set it to? We want to be setting it to the current rotation plus uh, an integer version of scroll. Now let's check what that gives us. Now, as we can see, when we scroll, it is going to very, very slowly rotate, right? Because it's going to rotate at increments of either one or negative one, uh, which is not what we want. We want this to be probably increments of 90. So what we can do is we can simply multiply this by 90 um, and that should give us, you know, a proper value that we want, right? Let's verify that. Now, as you can see, when we move the scroll wheel, um, we are going to be rotating our blocks at nice 90 degree increments. Cool. All right, so that's done. We have done the rotation. Now, what we also want to do, we also want to um, basically implement a modifier, okay? And so, a modifier means, for example, holding control or holding shift to do something. And so now let's say that we want to be holding shift to change the hue of our um, our parameter, right? Instead of changing the scroll. So what we can do is we can simply 
make use of the, the knowledge we've gained before by grabbing a value from the device um, variable, right? And so what we can say is we can say if um, UI event dot device dot is shift key. Now remember, I know that these are called is shift key, is control key, etc. cetera. Uh, in your case, you would go to the documentation or learn about them in the course, right? Okay, so if we are holding the shift key, then we want to be setting Q. And otherwise, we want to be setting the rotation. And so we can do it like that using an if else. Let's make this description as well. We want to do rotation here. All right, so to grab the hue, I am going to be copying these two lines of code and simply change the name of the parameters because that is a little bit faster. So we can say hue, and then um, we want to be evaluating this as float, right? Because I believe that this is indeed a float, right? Yes, we are going to be setting a float, just like that, eval as float. And then of course, here as well, we want to be setting hue and then not at increments of 90. Uh, hue needs to be a value between a zero and a one. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to say uh, scroll divided by, let's say for example, 10, right? And so now when we go back to our states and we enter a new block, when we move the mouse wheel without holding shift, it's going to rotate. And now when we hold shift, it's going to allow us to scroll through the different hues at uh, 10 intervals, right? We could also divide it by 100 to get a more smooth change of hue. Uh, but for now, in this session, this is perfectly fine. Okay, cool. All right, let's go back to our presentation and check out what else we need to do. Uh, as you can see, we have now successfully completed these objects here. Now, next thing. Context menus. We, of course, also want to be able to uh, create a context menu that allows us to change the type of block they were placing, either an 8-pin or a 4-pin. And you could either you know, do that once again using a button you can press or a key you can press, but I want to do this using context menus so that I can show this as well. The supported UI elements in a context menu at this time are checkboxes like this. We can do an action item which allows us to uh, call some functionality when we press it. We can have a radio strip, which allows us to, for example, change um, settings or modes. And then we also have a separator item, which is sort of more of a cosmetic thing that allows you to separate elements in your um, context menu. Okay, so to create a context menu, it's fairly easy. You can go to the documentation page and uh, check out a uh, viewer state menu. And on there, you can read about uh, how to create all the different um, elements, right? For example, the checkbox, the radio menu, et cetera, et cetera, as well as how to create the actual uh, viewer state menu. Now, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be copying the documentation and running you through what it does. Now, you might be thinking, let's put that here in on menu action, but that is not what you want. The, context menu needs to be defined before you register the state, okay? And so to do that, you of course need to put this code here in the create viewer state template method. And on here, uh, this is where we can uh, put our stuff as well as bind our menu to the template. Now the template is the viewer state template. Right? So this is what is going to get registered. So make sure that when you create a viewer state menu, you actually bind that menu to the template. All right. So to begin with, we first need to define our viewer state menu. So I'm going to be calling this um, block type. And then what we want to be showing in the UI is also uh, block type, right? So this is what the user is going to see. And then we don't want a separator. We don't want uh, a toggle item. We don't need checkboxes or anything else like that. So we're going to remove those. And what I like to use is uh, making a radio strip, okay? And so what the radio strip needs is three arguments. The name of the radio strip, so we're gonna say block type. We need to give the radio strip um, um, a label, right? So the user knows what this radio strip is for. Um, so we can say um, number of pins, for example. And we also need to define a, um, a default value. And I'm gonna be saying zero there. 
Now, now we've created a radio strip. We need to add radio strip items. And the way we can do that is making use of m dot add radio strip item. Now, the reason it's m dot is because we've stored this viewer state menu as a variable called m. Now, what is this item going to be called uh, internally? Uh, or what radio strip, it radio strip is item going to be added to? It's going to be added to the block type radio strip. So let's just paste that there. What is the internal name of the item? We're already calling this one zero and this one one. Zero is going to be our eight pin block and one is going to be our four pin block. You can call this whatever it is you want. Um, I'm just gonna be using zero and one because I know what that means. And then of course the label. So we can, for example, say uh, eight pins and uh, four pins. Now you can also bind hotkeys to context menus. Uh, we don't have time for that in this session, so that's something you can learn in docs or uh, learn in the course. Um, so for now, we are going to be using this as is, which now means that uh, when we go back here and hit enter and right click, we should be getting our context menu, but it looks like we've messed something up. So let's take a look. Okay, so um, there's a little mistake that we've made. We've named the radio strip the same as the the menu itself so we're going to say uh call this one block menu like that and that should resolve our error there all right so now as you can see we have the the label block placer or the state name and then the uh, radio strip menu called number of pins with the four and the eight but as you can see when we select these options here and uh, nothing happens yet and that is because we now need to take a look at the um the on menu action Okay, so first things first, what I like doing is um, print the menu item whenever this method is called. And so now when we select four pins, it's going to be printing the block type. Now, when we look at our code here, what is block type? Block type is the name of the radio strip. So what that means is that if you use a radio strip, for, for example, an action item, we can't just simply get the value of the radio strip by printing the menu item. We need to know what the value is of that menu item. Okay, so we're gonna say if menu item equals, and then we're gonna say block type, then uh, do something with it. Okay, and so to grab the value of the radio um, strip, what we can do is we can simply say uh, value equals quarks, right? So this is the quarks dictionary containing all of the uh, the useful information about uh, this uh, event callback. And then on here, we want to grab the value of block type. And so now when we print value, we should be getting either zero or one, just like that, right? So zero for eight pin and one for the four pin. Cool. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be casting this to an integer. And the reason you might have guessed already, that is because the parameter that we're going to be modifying is an integer. Now, so how do we update that parameter? Uh, we're once again going to copy some code from uh, a previous section. We're going to be saying latest entry, right? Because we want to be updating the latest um, multiparm entry, just like that. And then we're going to say self.node.parm. And let's check out what that um, parameter is called internally. It's called variant underscore and then the multiparm entry. So we're gonna say variant underscore, and then we're gonna make this an F string. And then we're gonna say latest entry. And we're gonna say dot set. And then we're gonna set that to be value, right? Which is the menu item that we've set. All right, so let's check out whether or not that works or not. So we're gonna say four pin. Now we have a four pin and then we have an eight pin. Just like that, we can switch between the different values. Now, what you might've noticed is that when we set this to four pin and we click, it changes back to use the um, eight pin, even though this menu is still four pin. And that is of course, because when we add new multiparm entry, these parameters are gonna use their defaults. So what we'd want to do is we wanna add some method that is going to store the default values for all of our stuff. And then whenever we add a new multiparm entry, we are going to set those defaults, okay? So let's make a new method here. We're gonna say uh, def um, 
set new entry defaults. And then in here, you of course want to be setting um, set rotation, set hue, set uh, variant or what type, sorry. And um, set position as well, if you wanted to. Now, I'm not going to be showing you how to do that because I think it is a nice challenge for you to um, do that yourself uh, to sort of check whether or not uh, you've learned something in this session. And so with that, thank you for attending. And if you've enjoyed this, please check out my course. It would be great to support that. And uh, thank you so much for your time.